Hey, this is Eric Liederman, and you are watching it live from my drum room with John DeChristopher. All right, well, welcome everyone to Live from My Drum Room. It's a pleasure to see so many people watching live today. Thanks for tuning in. My guest today is Eric Liederman, who is a producer for Late Night with Seth Meyers and a drummer. He's also a two-time Emmy-nominated producer. He's a writer. I had the opportunity to see him at PASIC uh, last month and during a panel discussion, and I, I couldn't wait to get him on my show. If you don't know about Eric's history with the show with Late Night with Seth Meyers, he is the architect behind the rotating drummers, and we're going to talk about that today and all the different well, we won't talk about all the different drummers that have been on the show. That would take a long time. But we'll talk about some of them, and we'll talk about his role and, and uh, just the whole concept of that, which has really become such a cool thing. He's a friend to all drummers in the world. Um, and he has a cool story, too, the fact that he is a drummer himself and played professionally and, you know, in a touring band. And, and uh, so, you know, he can, he can talk the talk and walk the walk as far as drumming goes, too, and that's a, that's a big deal. So, thank you all for tuning in today, and uh, without further ado, I'm going to welcome my guest, my friend, Eric Liederman. Guys, I got to tell you, network, big network TV producer, <laughs> shitty home setup for audio. It's not great. <laughs> I got a beautiful monitor. I got a really overpriced apartment that all my money's invested into, and uh, I can't connect the audio uh when it's a game done look i had a great frame my original frame was my cool pinball machine this beautiful acrylite copper look at that snare drum in the corner to make me look like i'm really connected to the drum room and now it's just going to be a shot up my giant nose looking at my ceiling <laughs> this is great what a fucking disaster oh boy hey, by the way speaking of that beautiful acrylite snare drum uli salazar is watching yes Oh man, that's a beauty. That's because I told him. I literally said, "I go, hey, I'm doing this thing. Be sure to check the sick Ludwig promo I got in the corner." But everyone should just look at it real quick because it's not going to make yeah. the cut. Look at that beautiful. That's six beautiful, and a half man. with the new throw. Oh, it's uh, just hubba hubba. It, it, luscious. It really is. Well, what about that Millennium Falcon parked underneath it? What's cooler? That's a tough one. No oh boys. I I think I'd go Sorry, with the John. snare drum I'm... slightly. Just slightly. The snare drum has a slight edge. My son would pick the millennial. A little bias Falcon there. <laughs> God bless no, him. God Eric, bless the best of both worlds. So good to see you, buddy. It's so. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm so. I've been. Oh, so it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. I mean, since I saw you, you've been working. The show's been going nonstop, right? So you, you've not. I mean, this is kind of like your day off Friday. Or no. That's correct. Friday, we do shows Monday through Thursday. We were just off last week. And before that, we had an eight week run, which started after the writer's strike um, wrapped up. Yeah. So then we had that. That's I think eight weeks is the longest we've ever done um, continuous shows for. And um, then to have that break was nice, but everyone was so thirsty to get back that it didn't feel like a long run at all. And now we have two more weeks and we're off for um, uh, holidays. So yeah, great. Great. The show's great. You know, I, I, uh, I record it. I don't stay up late enough to watch it, but I, I record it and I just, you know, I, I, I've always loved Seth. I, top Fantastic. Of the yeah. We, yeah. John, don't ever stop watching. I don't care how you watch it. Just watch forever so we can do the show forever. I think that's, uh, <laughs> I, I love hearing that people actually, but also while recording the show is great. I assume you mean DVR, but, uh, to me, I'm still old enough where, I have to figure out how to set a VCR to tape a show. And that's always my first uh, instinct. But even now DVR feels antiquated on some level, but I will not let that happen. Yeah, Everyone's like, oh, right. I just watch it on YouTube. I'm like, no, you can DVR it. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. They count I that. I, I, Nielsen. Okay, no. good, good. I, I, I hadn't thought about that too, but um, yeah, I know, I know all the, all, it's all the rage to watch stuff on YouTube, but I, I never think to do that. I just, yeah, I, I DVR it and then watch it the next day. Perfect. Yeah. Your secret's safe with me. Totally Thank fine. You. Thank you. And uh, lots of folks watching. It's great. You got to, you, you know, you're a friend to all drummers, as I said during your introduction. Um, you know, the show is so, it, what's so great about it, it, you know, one of the things anyway, is it's so, it's become so drum centric in terms of, you know, the rotating drummers and who's going to be this week. And um, so it's, it's, 
really a unique concept that you've come up with. Thank you. Yeah. My pleasure. Um, let's, I love it. But let's jump backwards though a little bit and talk about you as a drummer, because I, I, I heard a little bit about it at the panel discussion. And uh, I think that's, that's really key to where you are now, you know, what you've, how your career has evolved. And I mean, you've started out as a 10 year old wanting to play the drums and wanting to be a drummer like so many of us. Yeah, I think it was that moment, you know, I'm a, I'm really an eighties kid and seeing Tommy Lee in that 360 spinning cage on the girls, girls, girls tour. I was like, Oh, it was like very easy. I was like, and again, this also comes down, not even MTV or like the, I think the wild side video was the, um, the first video off that record, first single off that record. And um, it wasn't even that it was um, a Pearl ad Mm -hmm. where he was upside down, probably in modern drummer yeah, or yeah. even back in the day they had, you know, drum ads in music magazines. So it was either like circus or like metal edge was that Pearl ad with Tommy upside down, full lights blaze. And I was like, Oh, I want to do that. Like it was so easy and it was such a calling. I wish everything in life was that easy. It's like, yeah. Oh, that person, that job. I would like that mattress. I mean, that's mattress is another thing. We'll talk about that in a separate chat, <laughs> which I have another podcast where people are asking me about my favorite mattresses, which is uh, the fucking podcast. I love you, John, but that's the podcast I really want to do is talk about mattresses. All right. Um, I want to hear that podcast. Pillows. Oh God, it's so boring, but it's so great. Uli, who's listening really, he he loves pillows. I love mattresses together. It's um it's a real force to be bored with. So um that is a smaller meeting, another smaller meeting we'll discuss. But yeah, Tommy right away it was very clear and um to this day that i know that image it's seared in my brain and that was like no brass no uh no woodwinds uh yeah. <laughs> no yeah. strings yeah. no guitar even drums drums and that was yeah that was a uh, fifth grade for me i was 10 fifth grade yeah and you know i think to to your generation you could you could argue that tommy was kind of like what Ringo was to my generation, you know? I mean, he was certainly, I mean, it's, sure. it's hard to really compare anybody really to Ringo in terms of his, the overarching, you know, influence that he had. But, but I remember, I'm, I'm older than you, but I, I was in my twenties at the time and, and I was working in, I just started working in the industry when they hit and yeah, I mean, it was like nothing else I'd seen in a long time when, when I think when that's a thing came. too, right? You know, it's like, you know, Think about, you know, uh, Kiss wrapping it up, whatever yeah. that means. Yeah. What's that, Chief? Yeah. Oh, you're not really wrapping it up? Um, <laughs> I feel like, I do feel like that is, um, that's a thing Like I, that, that people don't get. It's like that, it's your generation. I say that about Saturday Night Live too. You know, Seth always says everyone's favorite Saturday Night Live is like when they were in high school. But, mm -hmm. there's, so, but there's something to be said about pioneering and the lack of media and everyone had less sources to, you know, take in pop culture, even like for products, uh, you know, household products or anything. It's all about the technology and how it's delivered to you. Right. So right. you guys were given the Beatles and of course the Beatles are amazing. And of course they're prolific and the songs are um, ahead of their time and also like give respect to a prior time. So they're timeless. Right. And everything after that could be argued right? That it's derivative. So everything's derivative of something else. And Beatles are derivative, you know, from many other genres that did not come from Britain, you know, uh, in that time. But uh, that was our thing. And our thing was getting videos through MTV and getting, um, you know, through and getting our drums and getting our stuff through magazines. And to me, like that was our thing. So a lot of people like, you know, generation like, well, our guy and I go, as you get older, you're like, it's not about what's best. It's about how you got that information and what felt culturally relevant um, at the time. And the zeitgeist dictated that. And I wouldn't trade. Everyone makes fun of me about like glam rock. And we've talked about this, but I will never, I'm so into it. I thought I grew up at the best time. Everyone's like, oh, well, we had the Beatles. We had Zeppelin. We had Black Sabbath. I'm like, that's cool. I had Motley Crue. I had all that glam rock stuff and I loved it. And, it, was, and it defined me as a drummer on so many levels yeah. and as a music fan. So, yeah. No, that's great, man. Exactly. You, that you own that. That's yeah. That was your, that was your influences and, and your, you know, what, what made you want to be a drummer and uh, yeah, absolutely. 
and you know, and, and you great point about MTV because we didn't have that in the sixties or the seventies even. And, and that was such a huge, you know, part of delivering music to all of us, you know, and, and, yeah. and product placements and, you know, getting company yeah. logos and, and all those kinds of things and what that did for, you know, like just driving it. It was incredible. Yeah, that's a big thing. And we can talk about that. I don't want to jump ahead, but, you know, the fact that we have a Ludwig kit on the stage, you know, before that was Tom, before that was Gretsch, before the program was really established. And I think there's always a thing like, not everyone, but there are some guys who are like, well, what's the kit? And I'm like, that, everyone knows what the job is and everyone knows that the kit is static and like the kit yeah. is here. We're not going to change the kit every week. But that branding in a way has gotten more specific, but also people are more open especially for a temporary gig like this to, to be as to be engaged with like another person's brand for the sake of the art, which I think is one of the, a positive thing with all the choices everyone has and the brand allegiance is, is shifted a little bit. So we could, I'd love to talk about that later, but I just wanted to say that about, uh, about that because you bring up brands and marketing so essential to what really shapes our influences um, in all things. Yeah, so absolutely. very important. Yeah. So, so you started playing as a, as a youngster, got in a band or got in bands probably as a teenager, like local bands, high school at friends? 10. At 10. Yeah. There, wow. Yeah. There was, uh, at, when I was in fifth grade, you know, it's that thing where, where you go right to snare. And of course, every uh, drummer who's not really a good drummer or disciplined drummer, I'm raising my hand, is um, <laughs> like, I need the kit. So yeah, of course, uh, because we're, we love drums, but like, are we great at it? We're fine. We're good. We can hold it. We can hold our own. Uh, but we are uh, we are in awe of like the the real masters, right? So long long story short, it's like I get the kit, and then six months, the guys in sixth grade are want to form a band. They're at a different school, but I become like the young hot shit drummer who's not good at drums, but good enough who can hold it down, and who is playing in a band called The Chosen. And then we change our name to Rather Fast. Or it was the other way around, rather fast first and then the chosen. And we were gigging in backyards. And eventually that band evolved um, through junior high and high school to become crumb cake. <laughs> and it was <laughs> and it was gr it was it was a lot of it was really grunge by the time we got to high school where we were playing out like real real shows, but they were still backyards, high schools. We weren't playing clubs. We were suburban kids of the North Shore in Chicago. But that is when I was 10. I was always playing shows and you had the anticipation and the prep of playing shows, even if they weren't significant basements, backyards, yeah. um, local town things. But yeah, that was, it started pretty quickly. It, it went like, you know, you hear the stories about all the product, like, uh, Oh yeah, I was eight. I was playing in the clubs with dizzy. And, and I'm like, <laughs> great. I was playing like adjacent to a Dunkin' Donuts and like some kid, right. like, you know, pants, some other kid. And I'm like, I was there. I was playing drums. Like the, the no one gives a shit show, but it was, it still gave you that experience. So no, it's, it's nothing, there's nothing like it. I agree. I, I started playing a little older yeah. at, than you were, but I, I was in my first band at 13 and we were gigging and I look back at those times and I go, man, what an experience like that we had at such a young age that, and I think nowadays, I think you'll agree for a 10 year old to start playing drums today. I don't know that he or she would have the opportunities we had to, to play gigs, you know, those, in those days there were dances right. and, and functions where, you know, they'd hire a band or just come play in the backyard or whatever. And it's different. Right. Now, you know? Yeah. It's a, it's a little different. It's different now, but like, to your point, it's like people, and I think this is, in a, this is, I will try as hard as I can not to be preachy, which is very difficult for me because I've met so many different kinds of drummers from genre um, and gender and race and every the way that everyone defines themselves now, in addition to being a musician, it's just, and you got to remember, it's like, it's still about going out and playing gigs. Uh, but then it's yeah. the other thing is being older generation. It's like people don't feel the pressure to play gigs because they just turn on the phone mm -hmm. and then they're live, you know, um, and they're broadcasting themselves playing. And that experience does not translate into hitting the road or even prepping a show or having eyeballs on you. Uh, and then when I have players come in who have been on only the socials, you see their face when they realize, oh, I'm playing a show. I'm not playing for clicks and likes and a different kind of um, satisfaction slash adoration. And to see that light change behind people's eyes is um, is very interesting. 
Yeah. There's some things yeah. never go out of fashion and that's getting a um, real world experience. So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so, and so you, I mean, you, you had a, a mindset of wanting to be a pro drummer. Um, I know you, after high school, yeah. went off to college. Uh, what did you study at college? Did you study um, like what you do? Did you study like film editing or something related to what you're doing now or? Communication studies, yeah. which is a bullshit um, bachelor's degree for someone like me who <laughs> knew that I come from a TV family. My dad was a, um, and can, he's retired now, but he did a lot of play by play um, and journalism, sports journalism, you know, went to uh, graduate school in Syracuse and really did play by play for a long time. We moved to Chicago and it was always about entertainment even if it was sports and also a very good piano player as well. But it was okay. that thing where he, um, he was, he was in the business of show yeah. and uh, we're all, if we're performing and we're out, we're all doing those things. So I sort of um, knew that I could always do TV as a, as a showrunner, producer and writer. I'm like, that was my, it's so dumb because it's not a stable business, but that was my safe, my thing, I, oh, I'll always just be a TV producer. I'll do communication studies. I'll go into TV. I'll be fine. I was never, everyone else was worried. I was never worried. Every career test I took was worried. It's like a uh, religious leader was my um, a result when I took two or three career tests in college because all my teachers like, you could do anything you want, which I never knew was true or not. But they, they, they told me to take career tests because I was so, as you can see, all over the place. And I was like, oh, I can do that or that. And it always came back to religious leader. And I thought that was so fucking weird. I like was like, what's <laughs> wrong with me? I don't want to be in a cult. I don't want to start a cult. I don't want to influence and manipulate people. And I'm like, well, what's the closest thing? I'm like, oh, TV producer. So I guess, you know, with like a heart of gold and being genuine, which is my thing of being honest with people in those moments. So it was always going to be that. And then I'm like, I'll play drums and, and go for bands at night and not expect to ever make a real living doing that. So I had these two tracks of what I thought were, you know, some people are masters and they want to be a doctor or a lawyer or a drummer yeah. Yeah. or something. And I was like, I will have give myself options because that's what a producer does. <laughs> and ultimately, <laughs> you know, that's that that's the path I um I chose. But yeah, I was actively playing always and trying to be in bands um throughout college and high school, even though it wasn't you know, just getting experience. And then after college. Um, when, once I moved to LA after I was in New York, really trying to do both and seeing which one would pop first yeah, to, uh, yeah. to take me down, which, you know, which road A or B. And it seems to me from just what I know of you that you, you've probably always, even as a young person had really great organizational skills. I mean, obviously you, you do now for what you do, but I'll bet I'm, like, have you, when you had bands as a teenager or even in your twenties, were you kind of like the guy that was of course. The, yeah, of course. course. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I can see that. Uh, yeah. I mean, they hated me. They hated me for it. <laughs> you know, every band I was in, I would say, I'm like, you all hated me for it. You know, like e even like when I was in, like when I was playing with Scott Ian and that was like my break and they saw me at the, playing with a, a, my own band in LA and they wanted me to audition through my friend, um, Brian Postain, a very funny stand up. The, um, he brought Scott and Pearl to come see me play in my own band. And then they asked me to audition. And it was sort of that thing where I was like, huh, okay, well, now this is real. And now I have to like deliver, but I'm going to be a hired gun. It's not going to be my show. Mm -hmm. But even in those bands, like I worked very hard to like, I want to look at the merch. I want to like, I have a lead on a practice space. I, you know, I worked like for years to get us on Kimmel to get us actually on because we were a real, really good band, I thought. And uh, it wasn't like a vanity project. Like we were really, it was, yeah. the songs were great. But it was a uh, it was humbling for me because you know there's always in this life you can't most people are like I want to be my own boss, and the reason why most people aren't their own bosses is because it's fucking hard. Yeah, it's hard to call the shots. Yeah. So that was a great experience for me because in all my other bands I was not alpha. Eh, people might argue, but I was very like here's a plan, here's what we're gonna do, here's how much, here's a budget, here's a spreadsheet, and these motherfuckers who think it's like yeah that's not rock and roll are bullshit because yeah. even guns and roses and all their chaos, they still had people steering the ship. They needed people to help them. Once they started to get real success, any band, right. There's always someone who is like, 
And then that person though can sometimes go away and like, and it could be anything. It could be for whatever reason, it could be drugs. It could be, um, you know, a family thing. It could be lack of interest, whatever it is. Even the leaders can peter out. Um, you know, it's great when I'm doing a Facebook live and a drummer is calling me, I push the call that drummer <laughs> calls again because they don't take no for an answer because why wouldn't I want to talk? Here's the third time. I just want to call out. He'll never watch this, but John Theodore is oh, a very John. good friend of mine and a wonderful drummer, but three times in a row calling me and not taking no for an answer is the most drummer thing of all time. And I'm going to tell him, <laughs> yeah, he just called me a derogatory name. See, cause I don't, I don't deliver um, on a podcast and talking about you now because you don't take no for an answer after calling. This is, this is my life, by the way, after calling three times. Okay. There he goes. I, I put him in his place. He's been produced. Oh, that's fantastic. He's been, I just wrote He's been you've, produced, yeah. you've been produced. Hey, and speaking of John Theodore, you've been he's, produced live. Is yes. he, would you say he's been on the show more than anybody else? I just looking at the list. He's been on a lot. I know that he's one of your returning champions. Five weeks, five, five weeks, five weeks. Um, and this was back in the day when I was like, Hey, I'm just going to book you for two weeks straight. Um, because, um, I mean, I didn't know John, I, I just love queen so much. And then John was the new drummer. And I was like, I think Sid knew him for her DC days. And I just reached out and, um, I think I'm like, Hey, just do two weeks. Like there's no rules. Now I have more of a formula. But when I have players that I really connected with and the band connects with and the show connects with and it all works, like, you know, Fred will do two. We were just talking about Fred and I'm just like, I'll do, I'm like, Hey, how about you do two weeks? Cause Fred has like X number of weeks he does a year. And to have that option is really cool because, you know, we're switching drummers every week and it's like, Hey, stay another week and be real comfortable. Yeah. yeah. Um, and now I've made him real comfortable to the point where he'll call me three times in a row and not and think that like you know it's one thing if you call someone john they push you to voicemail it's like maybe the call didn't go through maybe they didn't realize it was me so then they call again and then they get the push <laughs> it's like oh it's definitely he's busy but a third time a third <laughs> time that shows you the giant rock ego of some of these players <laughs> god damn it this is bullshit is what he said see yeah yeah oh that's drummers are a curse i hope you're all watching you're a curse, and I and I and I and I adore you all for it. Bless you, <laughs> bless you. Anyway, I side I sidetracked you, but um, no man, no. Uh, this, this you is, just have to you just have to keep me on target. That's your job, not mine. This is great. This is great. All right, I'm going to produce you a little bit. Um, let's talk Please, about Fred. God, somebody. Yeah. Let's talk about Fred yes. Armisen and how that all began. That connection with Fred and you guys met while you were living in L.A. I think you said. Yes. Physical. Yeah. That is true. I was um doing music and of course doing tv as i said during the day and i would <laughs> i would wind up at a lot of improv improv comedy shows back in the day um and i saw him performing and i knew enough that he was a drummer and we chatted a few times mutual friends very casual acquaintance stuff and so when i was in new york um when i was living in la but i was in new york running a show called impractical jokers i got this opportunity that um that i create oh good it's a great show very funny I got this opportunity um, that I created, which is like most opportunities in life, right? I'm like, hey, late night is looking for a co-executive producer. And my attitude was, oh, I'll never get it. I'm going to tell my agent to put me up. Long story short, I get the job. And there I'm like, okay, so who's doing the house band? Because I could do that. Mm. Um, as a co-executive co producer, you, I oversee lots of different departments um, and areas of the show. Very, It's a very fill in the blanks type job, which I love as solution oriented stuff. So I'm like, well, I'll do it. And I'm like, well, actually it's just going to be a DJ. And I was like, oh, DJ. And I'm like, all right, I guess this is what it is. This is the great job. I'll, I'll make it work. And then Lauren Michaels, I think pitched to my boss, Hey, Fred should form the band and make it a house band. And I was like, the, the, the skies parted and opened up and I was like, <laughs> yes. And Fred um, had, uh, uh, Eli Janney on keys, Seth Jabor and Sid Butler from Les Savi Fav and Eli's from Girls Against Boys and he's like this is the core and I'm like okay like I didn't know these guys 
Um, but he's like, but we need a drummer because I'm going to play guitar. We have two guitar players. I'm like, great. So basically went through the audition process and Fred remembered me. Of course, he's like, wait, what are you doing here? Because I'm like, oh, I, you know, producer writer and I got the job. And he was, I think immediately, it took us, of course, a while to like work together and know each other in a real way. But I think he was like relieved that they had someone who actually was a musician, a working player. And I would say I played on a professional level for a few years um, who also had um, a ton of producing experience and writing experience. So um, over the few months, we say, I think he realized that. And then over the years, of course, I'd like to think that um, we have a very tight um, and trustworthy working relationship. But, um, you know, knowing that he was involved, like really, you know, unpuckered me. And I was like, I, we have a guy who gets it. We have real musicians. Yeah. And um, it really has been a joy to work with him ever since because we are on the same page, I would say 98% of the time uh, about things. And that is very rare and lovely. And it's a, it's a really wonderful, really wonderful relationship. I'm That's very great. lucky to work with him. And I, and I, I think he feels the same. Um, I hope he feels the same. I'm sure he does. <laughs> I'm sure he does too. And, and just the fact that you've yeah. been entrusted with this great, um, you know, program, you know, the rotating drummer thing, and it's, be, it's become such a success, you know, I think that I'm sure solidified his, his, uh, faith and res you know respect for the job that you do not that there's ever any question yeah about. that was well no I, it, it all is because everything is subject to the actual outcome right like i have as a producer sure. you actually yeah. have to produce results a lot of people say what does a producer do and i said it matters what the job is you know what i mean a producer to me is the produce produce results and anticipate need and when fred was like not there um he eventually he switched to drums and then he still wasn't there all the time because he's Fred Armisen. He's doing comedy. He's acting. He's traveling all over the world doing things. I just saw a need and a hole to fill. So I called Matt Sorum. I called Chad Smith, Abe Laboriel Jr. And I'm like, oh, they're like, they'll come out. I'll put you up. You know, you know, they come out. They are compensated. You know, everyone gets paid the same every week for the job. And and then I realized, I'm like, this is something we can do each week. And the band, it took them a minute. And I would say like a few years to like really trust the players I was bringing in. And again, I've made mistakes with some players who have not been a good fit. And, but it doesn't, you don't really know until you they're sitting behind the kid and, and that first, those first two snare hits of the theme ring out and they're often running in front of 200 people and they have to, they have to produce they Cause they are leading the band as we all yeah. know. So yeah. um, even though there's an MD, they're still the drummer and they're still front and center and there's a lot of pressure there, but, to be trusted with that seat um, by Fred is a big responsibility. And now I feel very comfortable. The band has to trust me, which took a minute. And ultimately um, the drummer has to trust me and I have to trust the drummer. It's mm. a circle of trust, John. And it really is. Yeah. And someone, if someone isn't into it, it's a rough week, rough. And we've had yeah, a couple, yeah. but I like to think of the last few years that we're, we're batting a very, pretty high average of successful players. That's great. So, um, and I won't ask you yeah, um, most weeks, most weeks, I won't ask you about any, any bad experiences, but are there some, some people that really stand out as far as um, doing a, you know, a great job, like obviously John Theodore has been back a bunch of times. And cause I mean, so much of it, as we know is besides being great players, they've got a really sort of groove with the band, you know, and, and kind of the, the band is the band. So you're not going to replace the guitar player in the band because the drummer isn't digging them, you know, isn't enjoying it. It's like, you got to get along and are, and you're as the producer, you're sort of the conduit right between the drummers on the show and the band. So you have to be the heavy maybe at times and a hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, Eli, Eli's our keys player. He's the MD, right? Mm -hmm. Even when, I mean, like Fred is the MD ultimately and has shaped the creative of the band and like how it all works. And Eli is like the nuts and bolts, you know, playing back, playing back the songs and um, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, um, I think the, oh man, getting all the photos, getting all the emails. We have a big shoot going on right now. We're doing a new day drinking today. <laughs> so I am, I am getting, oh, look, look at this. Great. This is wonderful. We're doing day drinking with Dua Lipa. So Seth is drinking during the day. It's 1.30, and I'm sure he's halfway on his way to being very hammered. And and comedy is being made. <laughs> um, I'm just going to forward this on. Everyone's going to take a pause while I work. 
and I don't want to no hear problem. it. I'm, nope. you know, <laughs> John was telling everyone, it's like, you don't do a show on Friday. And I'm like, nope. But apparently when there's, when there's work, we got to knock it out. Yeah. We got to knock it out when it hits us. Approved photo. Let's go wide on all platforms. 2.30. Okay. You got to multitask. I totally get it. Sorry, guys. Like, it's happening. Um, okay, there we go. Actual size. Um, so, yeah, I apologize. But, um, yeah, but ultimately, it is really a big – it is a – a big deal to have like, Oh, look at all these drummers that have been on the show to have all these. Man, when I see this list and I know that it's, um, I know it's, there's a second page to this, but like, there, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. it is wild. Yeah. It's unbelievable. It's wild. It really look is. at yeah. that. You've done an amazing thing here. It's like, yeah, this is for everybody watching at home. This is the MD feature from 2021 that they did. Modern drummer did a feature on Eric and it's really great. You can find it online. And this just only goes up until two years ago, all the drummers that are that have been on the show. So it's uh, it's wild too because we're looking at that time. You look, go to the second page, if you will. And what's sure. interesting to see is you go to um Steve. So March 9, twenty twenty, in the upper upper corner, you see that was the day that everyone went home for COVID. Yes. Um, he was there. Oh. I think it was three, nine, three. I think it was maybe that two, I think right. it was Wednesday. I think maybe, maybe it was that Thursday, actually the 12th. I was pretty sure. So for Roni did that week and I had been trying to get Steve for a long time. Um, and then you'll see, it doesn't pick up again until we went remote and did the show strictly remotely. And then Nikki, of course I wanted drummers who had done the show before. Yep. Um, She's great. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I get. So Nikki. So then, then we started having. I was like, you know, basically working with drummers, um, to for their technical setups. So my editor was helping me with that. Um, the band was having to record, you know, tracks individually and send them to Eli to mix them down, and then we'd send the drum tracks over, starting that July, and then we were just knocking out. You know, you could see when we had the time off in August in any of the breaks, but all those people up until we were back in the studio, which is sometime in, um, even when we were back, even when Seth was back in the studio around Labor Day, mm -hmm. it was just like a crack team. You know, there was like a handful of us. We were still doing the band remotely through um, the pandemic for like a, at least another year, I believe, before the audience came back and then yeah. more staff yeah. came back and then eventually the band came back in the flesh. So to coordinate all that was a challenge and an exciting one, but it was really a stressful time. I mean, I, I, I remember all of these conversations when I look at all of these people and the people who like were technically savvy and the people who understandably maybe weren't with microphones and lighting mm -hmm. and wardrobe. I designed a lot of people's studios with my interior design skills. You know, I remember Emmanuel Caplet had all her stuff like in chaos around her. Um, and I get it. It's a studio. My studio's gross. You know, look at this background that I'm, I'm speaking to you at now, John, it's, it could be a lot better. And I know, and I know better, but you know, I was like, Hey, how about you take all these drum kits, stack them in the corner, make it look nice. And then, you know, cut to today when most drummers who are working players have some sort of setup that at least allows them to record from their homes, if not live broadcast. I mean, look at your beautiful setup. It looks great. You know, you could Thank record, you. you could do it. It's great backdrop, but it is a thing that sort of came out of the pandemic. And I think it was for the better where drummers actually use their homes or home studios as places of work um, for multiple things. And I think that was one of the really positive things that came out of the shit show of, the, of COVID. Absolutely. I totally agree. And I, I've talked to many other drummers who say the same thing that it's, it forced a lot of people to, to, you know, that, that had thought about doing it for a long time but never got around to it to like, okay, I'm going to, if I'm going to be sitting on my ass for, you know, for six weeks or eight weeks, I'm going to do this now, you know? And yeah. I, and yeah. I think some people anticipated it and some people were like um, forced to do it for income, yeah. you know, 
a lot of drummers had real, I'm sure, you know, there's real things where it's like, you always need a second skill set. I don't care what anyone says. And they're like, fuck, am I going to drive Ubers? Am I going to go wait tables? Am I going to go back to like working that old job I had that I went to college for, you know, that I don't want to do anymore. Like a lot of drummers had to pivot and the ones who were like, had, were lucky enough to have the means and the know-how to like set up those studios are the ones who got to continue doing it and now set themselves up for more work post the pandemic. So it was a really transitional time. And I'm glad that we got to capture it on the show that way. And, and the band didn't really lose a day over that wow. time. And, and the drum program also did not lose a day, really. That's amazing. That is amazing. And, and so you, we, you sort of, we sort of touched on this. So um, the whole idea of the rotating drummers was born from, <clears throat> just to recap that, it was born from the fact that Fred has such a busy life doing so many other things besides being the drummer in the 8G band. So did you, did you kind of just say, I'm going to, you know, why don't I invite some of my friends to come and sit in with the band? And it just almost as a, as a, like a, tr I think I read somewhere you, you called Chad Smith, maybe it was the first person you called or. Yeah, it was Chad just because it felt mainstream and broad enough to me. And I knew as a player, he could do it. And remember the system of cues and stage manager and, and stuff in the control room. I had to think of that yeah, and make that up and figure out a system knowing that we had ears knowing that I knew I wanted the drummer to take the responsibility, like a, a big band player who would lead the band. And to do that with a new player every week in, in hindsight was sort of dumb because you're putting so much pressure on them. But as a drummer, I, I relish in that responsibility and not every drummer does. Um, I think a lot of drummers, you know, and you can, I can, I, how many conversations have you had with drummers where you hear about their place in a very successful band and like we think like the Jimmy Chamberlain's of like the drums sound like this, Chad Smith. And without them, you don't have the band, Danny Carey, uh, you know, like bands that really people are air drumming in the crowd and the sound resonates. I, if, if John Stanier from helmet hits a snare drum, I know it's John Stanier. And I was like, dude, how do you get that sound? I tried all junior high and high school at that sound. He's like, dude, it's how you hit the drum. And it is, but there's also a thing there. There's a mm -hmm. thing there that comes through, an ethereal way in addition to the microphones and the mixing and the producing. So, um, but to put the drummer in that place, even if they have all the experience in the world is a big ask. And I said, so there are some weeks where I sort of forget that. And now we're also comfortable with it. I like, I joke with these guys and girls who come in and they're like, when they make mistakes, like in rehearsal and I go better fix it. <laughs> I go, that doesn't work. I'm like, band's not loving that. Like I play that. Yeah. You know, Eli and the band are nicer for lack of a better word. And I'm more blunt. I don't think I'm um, harsh. I think I'm direct. And my attitude is it's two 30. The show's at four o'clock. You better not fuck up the fills and you better not fuck up these cues because if not, not only will um, you look stupid, but you're going to fuck the whole show because Seth knows when a cue is weird. He's not a hyper musical person, but yeah. my boss, same thing. He's not, he's there for the comedy and stuff. It's like, and so am I, but these guys are my responsibility. But the room goes upside down and pear-shaped when a cue is blown. It's crazy how important the drummer is. Every show, every every fill, every cue, every bump in and out. And I don't think most drummers realize <laughs> that unless they have TV experience until they they play those that the first opening theme on the Monday and the first guest walks on. They're like, yeah. oh shit, it's on me. And then I'm like, Haha, I told you. You're going to earn it. It's This is a gig. It's not just about you and your your project that you're promoting and your face on on TV. It's a gig. And I think a lot of people realize that only only when they sit behind the kit for that first day. Yeah, yeah. No, I and I, I got to think there's so much pressure on you too because you've kind of, you can't change drummers on, if the show goes bad on Monday, you can't change drummers. Well, maybe, maybe you had to, but I don't imagine you can change drummers on Tuesday and bring somebody else in. And like, you know what I mean? If it was a complete disaster, you've got to be on the on site to fix it. You've got to be the guy to a hundred percent. Yeah. Um, to, to fix that problem. A hundred percent. And I, I, I remind people that I, that is like, like I, th I, I've never been in a position where I've been in. Let me, let me, let me rephrase. I've been in a position where someone shits the bed on a Monday, 
and the show, like we limp through the show and the band is bummed. It happens. I'm not going to lie about it. Like it happens. And I take all the responsibility in the world for the bookings. So it's on me. It's not the drummer's fault. It's not the band's fault. It's not the person who told me to book them. If I didn't know who they were, it's on me, only me. It's the buck does stop with me, like for sure. And the guilt I have is bad if it's bad. Um, but, um, I, after that bad show, I'm like, okay, we, you, you got another day. Like I'm not replacing someone. I'm not pulling them. If they're not a good <clears throat> drummer, we're going to get through it and I'm going to ride them and band's going to like ride them in their way. And we're going to, we're going to make them better. And sometimes it doesn't get better. Um, but we have no choice like to pull someone. Like I've had people have to leave because there's been like literally an injury or COVID and the show shuts down or the strike. Mm. Um, and like, we have no shows the next day, but just cause someone comes in and isn't great at this and the, and the, and the best ones get it on Monday. Yeah. And, and the great ones get it, you know, by like Tuesday, you know, like they're perfect on Tuesday. Like Brian Frazier Moore did it the last week. It's his yeah. third time. He's back for the third time because he nails it. And in rehearsal, he was stumbling on a couple of things and I was fucking with them. And I'm like, really? You know, like <laughs> he was just having a moment because he's human, but he's yeah. also Brian Frazier Moore. So you're like, Hey man, like I, I could tease him. I'm like, this isn't acceptable. I go, you got to fix it. And he's like, I got it. And then the show came on. It was like yeah. steady Eddie nailed it. So it is, we got to work with what, with what I book and no matter what it is. And um, it usually is, there are some that the band does not forget about, or I don't forget about because it was rough, but I have to say over since the pandemic ended, I've really tightened it up and I've in a way um, taken less chances because I'm more confident about, but sometimes, man, I get it wrong. I do. Well, <laughs> I'm not perfect. John. <laughs> John, can this be my therapy session? I think it's going to be. All right. It all started with my divorce 2017. <laughs> and then I booked a random drummer who hit me on LinkedIn. Okay. For another podcast. For, we'll do that on another podcast. No, this is great. With the mattress one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is great information. And, um, I was going to ask you, and I think you talked about this at the at the panel discussion at PASIC, but all the all the yes. music that you guys play on the live show, on the tape show, is all original music. So there's like, you Correct. don't have to deal with any licensing. We, but you'll do like for a warm up with the audience, you'll play like a a, a cover tune or something. But so, Correct. So, so the band is writing original songs with these drummers, like kind of on the fly, right? More or less. The songs are constructed of like an A and B part, you know, primarily two part songs. Like you could, you could say a verse chorus or like whatever you want to say. There's no vocals. Uh, traditionally we had back in the day, like the first few years of the program, I was very ambitious. And if a drummer came in from a band I loved, I would say, what's the song that um, I would talk to the band. Is there a song from this band? If they knew them that you'd like to cover. And I'd ask the drummer, what's the song I would get the song cleared. We would do like an instrumental version of it. Sometimes Eli would sing. I'd make the band learn a song. Like I remember like Tim Alexander was on the show from Primus and we did like Jerry was a race car driver. Sid Butler is not a, a not a slap bass player. And he'd be the first to tell you he's no less Claypool. He's an indie <laughs> rock bass player. He's a great player, but it's like, so, but like I made Jimmy Chamberlain, I made him do an instrumental pumpkin song. Uh, that was a B side in, in the uh, airplane flies high box set because the drum break is so sick and the riff is so great. And Seth Jabor like loves a challenging guitar part from like <laughs> Corgan. And I don't even think like, I don't, I, the mo only the most diehard smashing pumpkins fan would know that I had that song cleared legally to wow. play, to play as a, a commercial break on the show. And now those days are kind of over yeah. because like budget and things like else, it was like, it's a little unnecessary. And there's already so much that we're doing for the drummer spotlight wise. We're promoting their stuff. My photographer does a headshot for them. They get a great swag bag. I fly them in, we put them in a hotel and they get their, they get whatever they're promoting announced while the guys who are there every night, we're not saying their names. You know, the band mm -hmm. does an amazing job of deferring to this guest and elevating them week after week and these are guys who are musicians talented guys they have egos and they've come to a place where they're comfortable with this is what the program is and this is how it works and so it's it really is a whole 
Uh, it feels like I'm going off in tangents, but I know that all these things are interconnected to making the show work. Not just like we have a new drummer this week. Yeah, That's cool. It's so layered. And that's why I like the one thing I'll say to wrap this long ass response up is, is when I get those DMs or the emails or the texts, somehow people get my number and they're like defensive or like, hey, man, how come I haven't done it? And I'm just like, A, because the list is literally like a constitution length of information of just individual names of people who want to do the show. And B, because like there might be something where I've looked at it and I'm like, I don't, they're so, this is so layered. It's the personality. It's the way they play. It's their experience. It's the way that they post on social media and like the kind of vibe they're going to bring to, to our show. So it's so, it's so much more complex than people give it credit for. And it's so much more complex than I ever thought it was when I first started it with the blessing of uh, the show and Fred. Yeah, and that's the yeah. part that's like, I forget about sometimes. And you kind are kind enough to be interested in what we do. It makes me remember I'm like, Oh, this is actually something pretty nuanced and multi-layered. So I, I appreciate when I can belch all this out and barf it yeah. on everyone, because hopefully it, it reminds people about, um, why I'm not, I'm never going to be able to book every drummer in the world and why it is a um, calculated process, even when I get it wrong. I, you know, I look at what you do and I, I was thinking about this when, when you, a bunch of you guys did that great panel discussion. It was everybody watching. It was Eric Lederman. It was uh, Jules Thomas from drum workshop, Sarah Hagen and, um, and Eric Hughes. Great panel. Great panel moderated Great panel. by our, my buddy, Joe Bergamini. You know, I worked in artist relations for many years and your job is like, it's like artist relations on steroids. You know what I mean? In terms of like all the different, you know, personalities that you have to deal with. And, and, um, so I, I tip my hat. I just, I'm just saying it's, it's pretty wild what you have to contend with. And, and I have to thank think you, man. Yeah. You're constantly getting, you know, hit on so to speak for it's interesting you know that that stuff i think also like i'm not a fit people don't i always tell people like and anyone who's listening i'm like just follow me on social reach out in the dms a lot of people stand on ceremony they're like they're waiting to be asked reach out to me i eventually look at everything i get to it and i'm looking for working drummers who only play drums i'm not looking for a wonder like John Stamos is an amazing drummer, right? Great player. Yeah. He is John Stamos. He does not make his money playing drums so solely. He does it as a, a, a gig and he doesn't decide. He does a wonderful job with it. There's lots of players like that who I think also hit me up who are like, I'm this and I'm a life coach and I'm that and many things, which is wonderful. But like my job is to bring working active drummers. It doesn't matter how successful they are necessarily. And I'm going to try to get into more, um, local New York working drummers, East coast drummers this coming mm. year. Mm -hmm. um, Great. I'm going to try to open that up more less about, you know, big names um, for, for a couple of reasons, but you know, it's, it, I think it's just a reminder of there is, there are no rules here. The rules are like, you know, the, the, the whole picture. So I, I do appreciate people who reach out and I encourage everyone to do that and to follow the band and the show and to, to support art which is what I'm only thing I'm trying to do. The show is a com variety, comedy variety show. It's about Seth Meyers and his take on the world when he speaks to guests, when he talks about world events, when he makes his comedy. And I will tell you that it is like, that is what the show is. It's not about the, the show is about that. And the drummer is there to support the show. And I know Fred and I agreed on that day, like day one, when we started doing this. And I think that helped him give him the confidence in me to be like, I know what the show is about. Don't worry. This is not about, it's not about drummers and the people who I think that they make it about themselves will find um, that they're in the wrong place. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I, a couple more things I just want to go over before we, before we wrap it up for the day and thank you again, please for being here today. Um, one of you. Oh man. So I just want to say, John, it's so, it's so cool to, talk about drums just for fun with no pressure from someone who loves drums and i've done a couple of these things and i just when you came up to me at pace like i felt you came right up to me and i'm like this who's this fucking guy who jumped in front of all these people and i heard about you and then and i i told testa about it 
Uh, oh, uh, that's so funny. Who said what he say? Tell what did Tesla say? He's like, oh, the Viper. He said something funny about you. Yeah, yeah. What and was they, the code name? You guys have pet names for each other, which is gross, but whatever. Well, Steve, you're Gadd, both very cute. He, yeah, he named me the Viper, and he named Joe yeah. Testa Fonzie. Did he Fonzie? Tell you, did he tell you that? Yes, of course. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. Okay, I get it. I think that was uh, Kaz Kaz Rodriguez. Is drum buddies. <laughs> drum buddies. Oh, Kaz. Kaz. Kaz, Kaz, Kaz did Kaz. it remotely. Kaz did yeah. the show remotely. Great guy. Great drummer. And. Um, yeah, one wonderful player, uh, and I um I just think it's great to the one thing about it, technology and talking about drums and I'll get right back to your question so I don't step all over your thought but no, I just think okay. it's so cool that we can have these forums with uh you know whatever uh, it's not thousands of people um, who are as in, like it's niche and it's a niche thing and it's so cool and I'm just so always so um, flattered when people want to invite me out to talk about it uh, and and drums in general because it's a it's a nice community. I don't think it's too catty uh, for me, and I think yep. people are 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 nice and 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 lovely, and it's just so great to to talk about it with you. So that's my well, closing. I know we're not there yet, but no, but and it. and Joe Joe Testa is a great segue to my next question. I was going to ask you about, and I'll just say that you you bring so much to what I want, what I'm doing here, like as far as being a great guest, because you know you're a drummer, so you've got that whole background and. And what you do on the show is just so interesting and so cool. And, and uh, so it's, yeah, it, it all works great. Um, so. God bless, man. And likewise. So with Joe, the, the segue from Joe Testa, um, the Zildjian 400th anniversary event in Boston back in September, I know where Fred was the host or the MC, and he did a great job. And you were a producer of that show. And I was just going to, ask you generally kind of what your um what some of your responsibilities were what kind of what your overall role was with that it was a great show really well done thank you i appreciate that we worked on that for a long time kirsten brought me in um and joe joe and i knew each other uh and we're, we're buds of course joe had helped me early days with getting some artists on um and i knew him and when they had this 400th idea, Kirsten asked me if I'd be interested in, 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 you know, running it from a, like a third party, you know, mm -hmm. everyone there, I don't like to get hung up on titles. Joe and I always, we were talking about titles and how titles work in TV and movies. And then like, when we're like, when I'm executive producing an event and they bring me in to do it, there's still a lot of people who contribute and a lot of people to sate and a lot of artists to make comfortable. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of moving parts to it. But it was, we did it over like eight or nine months, you know, started with just with some Zooms and whatnot. But the the thing that I really appreciate about that whole experience is that Zildjian, um, as I mean, and I was a Pisces guy when I was, you know, signed as, as a player. And now, you know, I'm friends with all the brands because they're people. It's not everything. Yeah. Every, there is not one piece of gear or one brand or I think makes a bad product. It's all subjective and everything is just like, you know, too near. We all know this, right? But the people behind it, I, I have my one gripe with the drum industry is like, I've had to do a lot of legwork reminding people like, we're all people. My, what I'm in it for is for drums. I'm not like, I don't have any brand, any more brand allegiance to anyone else. Like we're all in this together and all of us deserve to work and to have their products out and to make a living. And I try to spread that wealth as much as I can. And That's I think great. I say that yeah. a lot. And I don't think a lot of people believe me because the AR guys, that's their world. I'm sort of sticking, you know, I got my, I'm in, I'm in the TV world, uh, but I'm sticking my hand and extending my hand to bring drums in. And then I go back to my, you know, go back to my TV at the end of the day. It's just a part of what I do, but I really am sincere when I say all these people working to, you know, assist supplement artists. I see what they are under and the way that they get bombarded and everyone wants something from them to get gear, to get publicity. And I understand and empathize with that because people are always asking me to be on the show. I'm getting yeah, a text right now about someone, what I consider someone. And it's like, I get it. Wants to be on the cover of MD. Who wants to play this tribute? And for the 400th, they dealt with all that shit with the artists. Yeah. With like, yeah. who's going to play what? And the one thing that I say that I give coming back to my answer is Zil, I, I give Zildjian a lot of credit because I pitched them. I said, what about what about um, having the artists 
that were honoring the honorees, I'm sorry, the honorees of that night, the legends not playing, not playing drums. Let them not play. Let them just sit and have drinks and be with their family and friends. And Joe and the team, like, I know what probably went through the family. They all had to like be sold on that. And Joe and Kirsten and, and sold that as like the way to do it. And they agreed. And it was not a fight. It was just like, that's the, it was great. And that collaboration to make the best show possible sort of set the tone for the way that everything else went leading up to that evening. And I give the Zildjian family and staff a lot of credit for letting me, I didn't win every battle, but I'm not supposed to, because sometimes you're like, well, that's not, how about this? I'm like, oh, that's a great idea. Truly collaborative once in a, once in a lifetime shit. Cause I'm not going to make the 500th. None of us are. Um, <laughs> and to actually see that be successful death joke, soft death, <laughs> dad joke. Um, but for, <laughs> for it to have gone as well as it did and people be as happy and not have it feel like just like a drum show. It felt like a thing show and have it have it be Aaron's last performance, oh, you know, and finding that light and all the sadness yeah. of his passing was like kismet to me. And it was so successful and so great. And of course, as a producer, I go back and there's 20 things I wish I had done differently. But overall, I was very happy with it. And I think the family was as well. When I went back the next day, we all met and like Erskine was there and saying how he was like, and I met him a thousand times and I'm sure he's not watching, but. He was always like, I'm like, yeah, I mean, Peter, you should do the show. Yeah, yeah. He was always a little like, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, okay. And not everyone is like, oh, I'd love to. And when he realized I produced the show, I think his eyes got big. And I think he put it all together. Yeah. Who I yeah. was, the show, the 400th, the legacy of being a Zildjian artist for so many decades. It all it all sort of crystallized there for him. And that to me, you know, Erskine's, you know, we're talking about Tommy Lee. I wasn't influenced by Peter Erskine. I'm impressed and in awe of his playing. And I know his his footprint on, on the, on, on the world of drums and music, but that's the kind of shit that makes it worth it. Right. And I think ultimately um, I, I can always look back fondly on that, on that show. And remember the strike was still going on. So I was able to be there for like the pre-production of the actual show. And we thought I wasn't going to make it like it all was so great and so yeah, perfect. And yeah. I'm so glad that people like you and who have seen many drum shows and festival weekends and all the shit, I think it really made an impact and so many fucking things could have gone wrong, John, and they didn't. And it was, it was overall very successful. And I'm just it really makes so, me happy for, that you loved it. So absolutely. And I and I've, you know, produced a couple of Zildjian's older shows. Nothing to the scale that you did. Yeah, yeah. And 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 that Di show, just a different just a different thing. Just a different yeah. thing, those shows. And, yeah. And what what you did, I mean, it was from from all of us in the audience, from my vantage point, it was flawless. It really was. It was just like the timing was great. It was incredible amount of music being played throughout the night but it never felt like it was too much obviously and it ran on time which they almost never do i mean you know all the things that you right you know, it ran set. on time yeah. thank it you ran on time it ran on time thank That's, you i yeah. time the show every night at late night and i pride myself on the show being like a little over a little under a minute it's a bad night it's like three minutes but most of the time we're within like 30 seconds and i was like this show is going to go so long and I'm terrified of it. And the reality is, like, I had to make video packages longer with all those guys. But Florian from Zildjian, who's amazing, shot yeah. all that stuff. And he was like, he's like, uh, I'm like, they got to make them like four minutes because we were worried about the set changes. Oh, Testa had more experience. Right. He's like, he's yeah. like, the set changes went from like 25, 30 minutes in rehearsal to like two, three minutes on stage. We had a great stage manager, Jeff, all the things that happened. And Florian's like, yeah, they're too long. And I go, you know what? Like, where I come from, we'd be editing that package in the edit suite backstage. And I was like, I'm like, we just got to make it long for insurance because we can't be sure that they're going to be, that all the set changes are going to be two minutes. And yeah. we're editing this stuff and shooting it 24 hours before. Wow. So yeah. it was just, all those things came into place. And John, it could have gone so fucking wrong because we had so <laughs> many, it could have gone so bad in so many ways. And I never said that to them. I was just like, I go, let's just get it done. And I, I was never really stressed the stress was taken on by Zildjian and Joe and Kirsten and the family watching them like AR and at, you know, the marketing division, everyone stepped up and, and did a yeah. great job. And we had all never really worked together in a professional way. And we did it in a way that coming from someone like you who said like, I love the show mission accomplished, great. you know, of wow. course, yeah, the family was happy Zildjian, yeah. the artists, I'm sure for the, everyone probably had some, I want to do that song or I want to like, who 
it doesn't matter. I know at the end of the day that everyone had a great time and the company felt honored and that was great. So well done. I guess it's a win. And normally I'm like, what the fuck went wrong? Not, not that much. <laughs> no. Very little. Very pretty, little. Pretty damn awesome. Yeah. Great job. And I was just going to say, yeah, just God. your great, great, um, you know, just the fact that you said, let's not have the honorees play. I yeah. Mean, you, you're able to take a, a much better sort of perspective on the whole thing as the producer um, to look at that. And that's something that, you know, when you, when you work for the company, well, no, we've got to have Shilly E come up and play. We've got to have Dennis Chambers or Terry Lynn, you know, yeah. but you're, you're absolutely right. Because, uh, you know, not that we, not that we, we wouldn't want to hear those people play. We've heard them. They're being honored. When, when we honored Steve Gadd, um, he did play, but you know, he made a joke about it. He said, you know, when Robert De Niro receives, you know, a lifetime achievement award, they don't ask him to act. He just accepts his award and, you know, whatever. So, I mean, and, and I think that's a great way to look at it is that you're honoring these guys. You've got people to, to play to honor them and let them just take in the, you know, the festivities. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yes, yeah. let them relax. And like the bottom line is this. I think players evolve. Like look at Steve Smith. What a, we'll Talk about an evolution of a player. He always had that, you know, jazz and fusion background. But then he... Right. he after a journey, he wanted to get back more into that. And he's evolved as a player that way. I think there's an ageist thing with people like, well, they're older, they can't play. It's like, well, yeah, on some level, it's like Dennis Chambers isn't, I'm sure like, I don't know, I don't know what he'd say. I don't know Dennis. He hasn't done the show, but it's that thing where it's like, Hey, do you want to play the sickest, craziest, fastest shit at the age you are now? And it's like, Oh no, I can't play it. And it's like, yeah, of course not. And no one expects any of these guys to, we want to sit there. I wanted them to watch and look at like, you know, we made these like uh, we had videos of like their best shit and compilations just like, and of course you can't get it all, but just like these short snippets of them playing because it's like, Ken, you know, I model after Kennedy center honors. And it was like watching Robert plant tear up when, you know, they were playing Zeppelin exactly. on stage with all these other musicians. You know, that's what it's all about. Exactly. That's what yeah. it, and like, I was too busy to notice if anyone was crying. I was like, I better see some fucking tears up there for these honorees <laughs> or else I did not produce the show properly. But I know that they were touched emotionally. I know that they were touched and um, I didn't need to interact. Like after the show, I think a lot of people, like my style isn't like, did you like it? I'm just like, I knew that we, it was mission accomplished because I saw the look on Craigie's face and fans and um, Eric Gross and Kirsten and all the people who had worked and even the, and the artists who paid in tribute that night, it was so worth it. And then mm -hmm. literally, what is it? A week or two weeks later, the, the strike was over. And late night was back. All the talk shows are back. And I'm just like, is when do things like this work out like this? So I know I yeah. just, I'm so glad you asked about it. And I'm so glad that you and, and hopefully others um, do. And I think we're going to see that video at some point um, in some format from Zildjian. I think it'll be really exciting for people who weren't there that night to witness. So looking forward to that. Fantastic. Well, Eric, thank you so much for being here today. And uh, it's it's a pleasure and and where are you anyway? Where are you? Where are I'm you I'm uh, I live in the same town as Craigie in Cohasset, Massachusetts, not far. Oh, from you're Zildjian. in Mass. Okay, I'm great. In Mass, yeah, yeah. I'm uh, I'm. I'm great. That's why you got that Godsmack. You got that Godsmack uh, gold record yeah, in the back. You Boston's see that finest. Back there. Yeah. Hell yeah! That's right. Great record. Shannon Larkin, monster. Yeah. It's another guy I want to get. Great player. Great okay, player. I'll stop. <laughs> Thanks for having me, John. It was it was a real it was a real pleasure. And if you ever want to pick it up, I'm down for it. And I can't wait to see all the comments uh, right. down below and all yeah. the resumes. Thanks for watching, everybody. Big hand for Eric Lederman. Eric, if you'll hang you with me for clap. one second. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end the stream and uh, we'll say goodbye in the room. But thanks for watching, everybody. And uh, lots of hands clapping for you right now. Oh, God bless everyone. Clap louder. <laughs> I can't hear you. All the way in the back. I need your adoration. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for watching. Thanks, everybody. All right. Well, that's my show. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, give it a like. Leave me a comment. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't done that already. And the podcast is available on all the podcast platforms. So download it. And remember, no drummers are ever harmed on Live From My Drum Room or Track Talk. And drummers, when in doubt, leave it out. All right. Again, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And I'll see you again real soon. See ya.